Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about the issue of control. How it is that organisations are able to ensure that people within them do what they're supposed to do. And we're going to look particularly at a set of theories which argue that for this to happen it is necessary for organisations to put in place mechanisms which ultimately force people to work together. A lot of this thinking comes from the work of Karl Marx and what we're going to see Marx set in train a particular way of thinking about organisations as controlling their members for a particular reason. In Marx's case it was to create a profit. So we'll explain how Marx develops his theory and then work through first Marx then um, a big innovation in Marxist thinking in organisation studies in the 1970s and the work of a man called Harry Braverman and then we'll move through to the work of Michel Foucault who is a French theorist whose ideas about control have been applied very very influentially very widely within organisation studies over the last couple of decades. So the aims for this session are that by the end of it you should be able to distinguish and let's put it accurately define Marx's concept of le value, labour power and surplus value and how they interact. And you should be able to speak to Marx's thoughts about organisations within capitalism. You should then be able to describe how organisations have historically responded to what Braverman calls the problem of management and we'll define that in a moment. And then finally you should be able to recognise the effects of what Foucault talks about as technologies of power or surveillance on people's behaviour within organisations. Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about the work of Karl Marx, particularly Marx's thoughts about organisations. So as many of you probably are aware, Marx was a, a German philosopher, political activist, economist, who is typically associated with Marxism or communism or socialism, which is a shame because really Marx's main written work was actually a detailed analysis of capitalism. He wrote significantly more about how he thought capitalist societies worked than he did about how he thought communist societies would work. And actually, this is one of the main criticisms of Marxism, that actually Karl Marx and many others didn't really say a lot about what Marxist or capitalist society, sorry, Marxist or communist society should do, but he said a lot about how capitalist societies worked. And actually, um, a number of people in the study of organisations have found a lot of value in Marx's thoughts about capitalist organisations, probably more so than they have about his thoughts around communist organisations. So, just as some background, Marx was was what's known as a Hegelian. And Hegel was a, another German philosopher who believed that human history was a story of progress. For Hegel, he was actually um, quite a religious character, so he believed over time man was going to get closer and closer to God. But Hegelians, like Marx, changed those ideas and thought, well, let's, let's see where is history heading to? And Marx articulates in, in his... Um, his theory, a story of human society progressing more and more towards free emancipatory societies where people genuinely are rewarded for their contributions and are genuinely supported for their needs. So this is one of the first things, just to get out of the way for you, many people think Marxism is associated with like redistrib redistribution or giving people stuff or everyone having the same that's not really what Marx was, was saying in his analysis, and it's not what he thought in his politics. So the classic phrase to keep in mind, Marx wrote, was that his ideal society be, would be one in which what was taken from people or from everybody was what they, they could achieve or their skill or their ability, and what everyone was given by the society was their need. Now clearly people have different needs and different skills, so Marx was not at all about equality or you know, equity or all this stuff that you might see in some like, online videos about Marx. So anyway, so that's kind of the background to Marx's thinking. Right? He was, was trying to describe capitalism 
to see where the next kind of society might come from. And Hegelians generally believed that progress works through a process which they called the, the dialectic, which basically means you get two opposite things, and at some point they come together and create a new thing. So if you think about like an essay that you write, it's a dialogue where you say, Here's one argument, here's another argument, and then you synthesise the two. So in dialectic theory we would say there's a thesis, an argument, or a thing, an antithesis, an opposite of the thing, and they come together in the synthesis to create a new thing. And this is what Marx thought happened in society. So in his analysis he was trying to find what are the fundamental thesis and antithesis that are going to come together to create some new new form of society. Now, all we really need to know about that for our purposes is Marx believed that the fundamental contradiction within capitalism was between those who worked, those who provided what he calls labour power, and those who owned the means of production. Now Marx says in production those two things have to come together. You can't have factories without labour power, people to work them. But just having labour power without the means of production, factories, computers, and all that kind of stuff, is nothing. Oh, sorry. Email alerts coming through. So this was the fundamental to Marx's analysis of capitalism, right? Is that out of that contradiction, this is where fundamentally we're going to see some development come. So that then sets Marx's next task, which is to ask, well, why in capitalism do these two things oppose each other? How do they tend to oppose each other? And what's stopping them from coming together? And this is what Marx tries to do in his, his main analysis, which is called Capital, Analysis of Capitalism. And in it, Marx starts with a, a simple commodity, a good, a thing that somebody makes to sell. And he tries to work through how that thing gets made, how it gets sold, and how that operates specifically within capitalist societies. And one of the fundamental distinctions that Marx draws between capitalism and other societies is around what he calls the generation of surplus value, or we would call it profit. So Marx wants to ask, how is it that capitalist organisations are set up so they generate a profit, and where does that profit go? And so one of his answers to the question as to why labour power and the means of production don't combine is Marx says in capitalist societies, the way they work is the people that own the means of production get to keep all the surplus value, or all the profit. And then they can buy more means of production, which means they can get more surplus value and more profit. And for Marx, this is the fundamental contradiction of capitalism. The fundamental injustice, you might say, is that surplus value or any value comes from labour power and the means of production. So workers and owners, people who do stuff, and factories and machines and you know, systems of knowledge and stuff. But in capitalism, all of the value that is created what we call the surplus value of the profit, goes to the people that own the means of production. And because of that, they can buy more of the means of production. And Marx thought fundamentally that was unsustainable and that it would lead to a crisis. Now, for our purposes, we don't really need to talk about that too much. But what I want to talk about is Marx actually provides a very detailed account of the way that work is organised in capitalist society so that that surplus value, that profit, can go to the people that own the means of production and not the workers. And he, he theorises in quite a bit of detail how that works. So let's just pick out a couple of his key concepts which we'll then work with in some subsequent videos. So we've already talked about surplus value. Now, Marx has a slightly different way of thinking about profit than many of us. Many of us would think about profit as reward for risk. You know, if you make an investment, you expect to return. Because you could lose your money. Marx thinks about it differently. Marx's idea is that in any society, there's a certain amount of values that need to be created, right? People want to be entertained, people need to eat, people need to be warm, they need water to drink, they need social relationships. There's all these values that need to be created. 
people needed to be able to sustain themselves. So this is like a big bag of value, you can think about it. So the question is, well, what's surplus value? Mark says surplus value is things that are created beyond that. So at the level of society, if you think of everything that everybody needs, that would just be what Marx calls socially necessary value. Surplus value is different. It's stuff we don't need to bother making. And the only reason in capitalism we make it is because it benefits a certain group of people. And even within an organisation, Marx would say, there's only a certain amount of value that the organisation needs to produce. There's only a certain amount of work that needs to be done. But in a capitalist organisation, you have to go beyond that to produce additional value because that's the profit that gets generated. And so for Marx, that's sort of pointless, right? Why make people work more than they need to work in order that some people that own the means of production can generate a surplus? So Marx's question from an organisational perspective is, how is it that within an organisation, production is organised to generate a surplus value? And how is it that that surplus value is taken from the people that are producing it through their labour power? So call them workers, but that's a very um, simple way of thinking about it. How is it that value that they create with the means of production is taken from them? And they the technical word for that is exploitation. How is it exploited from them? How is that value taken away from them without them realising it? So, you could argue that the reason that value, that profit goes to the people that own the means of production is because the value, the profit comes from selling the product, not from making the product. That would be a fair argument. Now, Marx discounts that as the most economists because he believes ultimately if you can make something cheaper and sell it for cheaper, a good capitalist would do that. So there's a natural tendency in capitalism to push prices down. Consumers tend not to pay more. Now, later Marx's theories have questioned that, but this is Marx's idea, right? So he kind of says it can't come from consumption. It just wouldn't work. So where else can it come from? surplus value has to be generated somewhere and he says the only place it could come from is labor power living labor people investing their physical their cognitive skills in the production of goods and products which are then sold okay getting a bit complicated but we can think about it simply right marx's idea would be a worker goes let's just think about it in a factory because it's easy goes to work in a factory and you know they make widgets all day boom, 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 boom. they get to a point where they've made enough widgets that can be sold to cover their wages but they don't stop they keep working and in capitalist organizations there is a tendency or a pressure to do more and more of that work beyond your wages because that's what that's the generation of surplus value which ultimately creates profit for capitalists or the owners of the means of production. And this is the, the motor or the engine of capitalism. Now, a technical name for this idea is the labour theory of value, but it just means that value ultimately comes from living work or labour power. So let's think about one of Marx's examples as to how it is exactly that a capitalist organisation creates, stop holding the camera, creates this surplus value. And how does it exploit it from the workers or from the, the owners of labour power? Because ultimately, Marx just thinks of a worker as somebody that owns labour power. And that's a product which they sell to the owners of the means of production, capitalists. And like any product, they have to make that labour power themselves. And so, this, again, to get technical, is Marx's idea is that the, the producers of labour power don't get surplus value. Only the people that own the means of production gain surplus value within capitalism. So a good example of this is Marx is writing about what, cooperation. Marx observes that many capitalist organisations, unlike earlier forms of organising, 
are huge. Sorry. Are huge industrial big buildings, right? One of the differences, if you just look historically, among through the industrial revolution, is that production started to take place in big factories where you have tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of workers all working together. Up to that point, production was always small scale. It would be, you know, a family working in a room or on a house or on a farm, not a huge manufacturing plant or a huge agricultural um, organisation. And it's common, even in like mainstream non-Marxist economics, to say, well, one of the benefits of doing that is that you gain economies of scale. The bigger you make stuff, the cheaper it is to make. Marx has a slightly different idea. Marx says, when you put lots of people together, they actually start to form social bonds with each other and create what Marx calls social labour power. Even someone like Adam Smith noted this, that if you divide the work up amongst lots of people, they actually produce more than if you've got the same number of people working individually. And Marx says one of the reasons for that is that people start to cooperate. If you're working faster than me, I'll speed up. If you're under pressure, I might come and help you. I'll do my own work and I'll do some of your work. So all these social relations start to take place when you put lots and lots of people together. But Marx says, what's the effect of that cooperation? Well, think about it. Each individual worker, let's just use some simple numbers, right? If there's 10 workers and they're each contracted for £10 a day and expected to make 10 things a day. So the owners of the means of production pay 10 people £10 for making 10 things. But through their cooperation, through working together, if those people make 11 things each, or even if they only make one extra thing in total, they're still only going to be paid individually for their £10 for their 10 widgets that they've made. So what happens with the extra ones that they've created through their social labour power or their cooperation? Mark says, they don't have an individual contract for that. They don't have a group contract for it. So it just goes to the owners of the means of production. They get to keep that extra product for free without paying for it. And in a way, this is quite beautiful, Marx says, because each individual worker has been paid fairly. So it doesn't seem like they've been exploited, right? Because they've each been paid their contracted work time. They've generated their 10 things, they've got their 10 pounds they're happy, they can go home, do what they want. But you add it all together and they make more, the capitalist, the owner of the means of production gets to keep that without paying for it. So this is one example of Marx's ideas about the organisation of work or production in capitalism. It is designed, Marx says, to exploit value that is generated through labour power value generated by workers working with the means of production in order that people that own the means of production can exploit any surplus that they create. Subsequent theorists have gone into a great deal of detail trying to analyse what's called the labour process or the organisation of work to see are there any other examples where capitalist organisations clearly exploit their workers, clearly take value from them that they've generated without compensating them for it. And we'll see in the next video on Harry Braverman, the answer to that question is yes. So, I've dribbled on a bit too long in this video, but hopefully, right, we've thought about some f background to Marxist thinking. We talked about labour power, so, you know, the, the, the power, the ability to do things. We talked about the means of production. We talked about where surplus value comes from, both in terms of Marx's concept of it and how organisations might be set up to generate surplus value and distribute surplus value. Hey there guys, so in this video we're going to describe Harry Braverman's work 
on the problem he calls the problem of management. Now Braverman was a was a journalist, a craft producer, who worked at shipyards and things, I believe. And in his work he noticed a, a tendency, I suppose is the right way of putting it, for managers to do certain things. And he turned to Karl Marx's work to try to make sense of it. And Braverman was particularly struck as a skilled craft worker with the ways that organisations and in what was supposed to be innovations in his industry tended to actually take skill away from the worker. And he tried to make sense of this. And he, he argued, thanks using Marx's ideas, particularly Marx's understanding of labour power and surplus value, which we talked about in a previous video. He argued that capitalist organisations have this fundamental problem, which is they rely on workers. So they need workers to do what they're told to generate the surplus value. And if workers choose not to do that, or choose to work in a different way, choose, for example, not to cooperate with each other, well then, they don't create surplus value and the whole thing doesn't work. So Braverman says this, this idea, this, this question of how is it that organisations are able to control work is key to understanding capitalist organisations. And he notices two, two trends, or two things taking place simultaneously. On the one hand, organisations have to generate surplus value, but on the other hand, they also have to control their workers to ensure that that surplus value is exploited by the organisation. And he contrasts the organisation of production in capitalism with things like guild production. So you might have heard like city and guilds or things like that if you're from the UK. In Europe in particular, but I think throughout the world, prior to the Industrial Revolution, knowledge about how to produce things, say like a musical instrument, would be the preserve of a guild, often associated with a particular place or a city. So Nottingham, for example, was um, very much associated with producing lace. And it kept that knowledge, right, because that intellectual property was key to its success. So it guarded it. So the knowledge of how to produce certain items would be kept within a city or within a group of people, a guild, who would police who knew about it. As a result, in this kind of production, it's very hard to actually do it in a capitalist way and generate surplus value for people that own the means of production because the workers have all of the knowledge. So you can't build a factory because you don't know how it works, you don't know what to do. So Braverman's argument was capitalist organisations have these two issues which he calls the problem of management. How do you organise work so that it's more efficient and generates more profit? At the same time, how do you organise work so that the organisation and managers in the organisation have control over workers? And the reason this is really difficult in capitalism, Braverman says, is because of the employment contract. In capitalist organisations, you pay workers, typically, for time, not production. You pay workers to to grant you their labour power, and see our previous video we talked a little bit about labour power, not finished products. So what does this mean? Well it means you can pay somebody and they might go to the bathroom and sit on their phone all day. Right now they've still turned up to work, they've clocked in, you know, they've scanned their QR code or whatever they have to do, but they haven't actually produced anything. Or they can turn up and they can sit at their computer and just be on Facebook the whole time. So they're not working, not doing what you want them to do. So, in this situation, there'd be no point investing in new systems or new computer programs or new production facilities if people don't actually use them properly. So this is what Braverman says is the problem. 
for capitalists, right? If they buy labour power, they buy people's commitment to turn up and say they're going to do stuff, but there's no guarantee that people are actually going to do it. And if you look historically throughout the changes in the development of capitalism, you get things like the Luddites who would intentionally sabotage production. And actually the shift from guilds to factories, there's a very interesting bloody and violent history around that. But this is what Braverman calls the, the fundamental problem of management for capitalist organisations. Right? They have to manage workers to work effectively, but they also have to manage to take control away from workers so that the managers control the production process. So how do they do that? Drawing on Marx, Braverman outlines a couple of key mechanisms in capitalist organisations, which make them capitalist organisations, I guess. So the first is through the division of labour. So one of the features of capitalist production, as opposed to previous craft or skill guild-based forms of production, is in capitalist production, work is divided into subtasks. And those subtasks are then given out to individual workers. In the past, in craft production, the craftsperson takes a product from the start to the end. And their particular way of producing it makes that product slightly different. Capitalist production, the production process is chopped up into little bits. Ideally, little bits which are so simple that anybody could do them. And at the end of it, a standard product comes out. Now Bravman says when you do that, we know that things like social labour power or cooperation occur. We know there are economies of scale. So by dividing the labour up, you make it more efficient, you generate more surplus value. But also by dividing production up into these series of tasks, well, the question becomes who divides them up? And the answer is, of course, the organisation managers divide the tasks up. So they have to start understanding the labour process. They start taking control of the labour process and telling the workers what to do. Telling the people who provide them labour power how to work. So this is the first thing, right? You get a division of labour. This solves the problem of management. Another way of solving the problem of management is through controlling the working day. So literally controlling the time that people work and what they do when they're at work. So why is that important? Well, if you can stretch out the working day, then you increase the amount of surplus value that's being produced. If you're only paying somebody for eight hours, but they're actually working for 10 hours, well, you get two hours for free. If somebody works through their lunch, someone doesn't take a break, somebody doesn't take holiday. You don't pay people for travelling to work. You don't pay people when they're helping their colleagues at work. This control of the working day actually increases the amount of work that people do. And of course also, controlling the working day means you get more and more control over the worker. Finally, Braverman says, supporting all of these things is technology and what does technology do technology takes skill that workers might have in their fingers or in their brains and takes it away and puts it into the means of production so a good example of that would be when you take a craft production process and say well we'll take some elements of it because a machine can do those well now you're taking something that was once done by human labor power and now you're doing it by technology. Of course, the technology may well be cheaper, but what you're also doing is you're taking some of the skill, some of the design of the labour process, and investing it in the technology. So now the workers have to work around the technology because the technology can't be changed. So all these examples, you see capitalist organisations solving the problem of management. They not only increase the surplus value that's generated, but they also take control of the labour process away from labourers, workers, and invest it in the hands of the organisation, the managers. And Bravman says this, of course, is not 
not what's meant to happen. You're meant to pay somebody to turn up and work. You're not necessarily forcing them to do certain things. And in recent decades, then there's been this big move to things which like job enrichment, empowerment, job rotation, and so on and so forth, where one of the consequences of the ways that the problem of management was solved historically was that workers became deeply unhappy. Workers became increasingly uh, in, aggressive towards management, and you got very bloody industrial relations. And workers became deeply unsatisfied. And so there's been moves to try to make work more enriching while still solving this problem of management. Now, most recently, um, an anthropologist called David Graeber talks about this. He suggests that what's actually happened in recent years is that by taking control of the labour process away from workers, work just becomes increasingly meaningless for them because they have no investment in it. Right? It's just something they turn up and do like a robot. Graeber's word for this is that work has become meaningless, what he calls them bullshit jobs, where even the people doing work think it's just, there's no point to it because all they're really doing is some like menial little task on their computer. Braverman would argue this is part of a long term trend in capitalist organisations to answer this question of management. Just to repeat again, creating surplus value, but also taking control of the labour process and giving it to the organisation rather than the worker. So, I've had a quick look through what, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what Braverman calls the problem of management, where it comes from because of the issues of labour power and the employment contract, and then we thought briefly about some of the ways that historically organisations have solved that problem of management. And my challenge to you would be Perhaps you can think of some examples of your own or think, look back at business and organisational history to see some of those episodes, like we mentioned the Luddites, and th there's many more. So in this video we're going to talk about the work of Michel Foucault, who was a French, not that that's important, but he was French, he was a French historian, just a general thinker. Um, often now described wrongly as a post-modernist or a post-structuralist, which he wasn't really. Um, he was a historian. And Foucault's th theory, I guess, was that to understand human history, we actually have to understand the, the ways that categories which we take for granted change over time. So he wrote a history of madness, and his argument was, we might think of madness as being like a, a black and white criteria, right? People are either ill or they're not ill. But actually, if you look historically, you see that behaviours, uh, attitudes, things that would, would have been considered, you know, mad, which is the term he uses, now were actually quite normal in the past. He also studies sexuality and says if you look at sexual relations and the, the conventions that govern sexual behaviour, what we now consider right and wrong, you know, natural and immoral, these things are completely different when you look historically. So Foucault's general you know, approach is to think how have things changed, things which we take for granted now, how have they changed historically? So he's not a historian, he's just sort of trying to describe what happened. But he's trying to understand how a particular um, ways of living take for granted historically, and how do those things change. Okay. All that sounds great, but of course nothing to do with organisation, behaviour. One of the things that Foucault focused on, though, is, and in his book, Discipline and Punish, Foucault focused on the ways that society treats people that break the rules. So, criminals, essentially. But it was not just criminals. And Foucault noticed, if you look historically, there'd been a big shift from what he called punishing people to disciplining people. So, in previous... Uh, societies and 
back in history. And I will make this relevant to organisations in a minute, don't worry. If we look back historically, people had a lot of freedom, but if they did something wrong, they'd be punished. So we start to discipline and punish with this story of this poor um, French guy who gets like, hung, drawn and quartered and flogged and burnt alive for doing things wrong. Because well, that doesn't happen anymore, right? People don't get punished for doing things wrong. So what does happen? Well, we tend to take people who have committed crimes and put them in prison. And the idea is that they're going to learn how to behave in prison. So Foucault's term for this is we try to discipline people. And as he started to think about how societies discipline prisoners, he started to see that those same processes are at work in all manner of areas, whether that's educational institutions, factories, hospitals, you name it. And this idea, Foucault's understanding of the ways that people are disciplined and made to behave in a certain way, has been incredibly influential in organisation theory over the last probably 25 years. Because Foucault's argument is to, to emphasise the way that people can be controlled to police their own behaviour, the ways that people can be encouraged or forced to do what you want them to do without anybody having to actually tell them to do it. And Foucault's general idea is that we live in organisations and societies where we're increasingly, we increasingly feel like we're being watched and because we feel like we're being watched we behave as though we are being watched. And it's a simple example. Drive down a street, you see a speed camera, people slow down. Now, historically, in Britain at least, for a long time loads of speed cameras weren't turned on. Nobody was actually getting caught. But the fear that you were going to, the fear that the camera was watching you, made people change their behaviour. So this idea that people self-police or self-govern their behaviour when they feel like they're being watched has been applied into the study of organisations, whether it's the ways that people have to are performance managed and appraised, whether it's the ways that people are continually measured and evaluated, whether it's the ways that offices are organised so that people can look in and see what people are doing. Foucault's ideas have been applied into all these kinds of examples. So let's work through Foucault's ideas a little bit with a aim of explaining how his ideas about surveillance can be applied to organisations. So the, the classic way to describe and explain Foucault's ideas is the way he does it, which is with the example of the panopticon, which you might have heard of, but I'll tell you what it is if you've not. So the panopticon was a, a design for a prison that was proposed by an English philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. Never really got, I don't think it actually ever got built, but Foucault says that the principle behind this design is, demonstrates most clearly what he's trying to describe. So Bentham's panopticon was a prison where you would have a wall of cells with open um, walls on one side so that you could see it. There would just be bars on one side and they'd all face a central tower. But that tower you wouldn't be able to see into. There'd just be tiny little windows that people could see out of but you couldn't see into. And Bentham's idea was because all of the prisoners in these cells were completely exposed and they could be being watched by people in that tower at any point, they wouldn't misbehave. They wouldn't do things you know, that prisoners do because they might be being watched and a bit like people driving past a speed camera, they'd then get punished. So Bentham's idea was if you set this up, you would need far fewer prison officers going in and you know, seeing what people are doing and intervening and punishing them people would start to self-police. The idea would be like there'd be a policeman in or a prison guard in everybody's mind telling them what they should and shouldn't do. And in fact Bentham and I think some others have argued that you even don't need to put any people, any prison guards in the tower at all because people will act as if they're being watched. Again a bit like the speed cameras that you don't turn on. So this then 
emphasises the importance of when we think we're being watched, we police our own behaviour. When we think we're being watched, we police our own behaviour. This is what Foucault takes out of Bentham's Panopticon. Now this idea has been adapted and people have focused on what they call govern mentality. So a mentality, a way of thinking in which you are governing or policing your own behaviour. And researchers have applied Foucault's ideas into organisational behaviour. And they've particularly focused on the ways that organisations both survey or watch or monitor people and the way that changes people's behaviours and then a process which they call normalisation, so reporting back. So what's this getting at? Well the idea is quite simple. If you tell people this is how everyone else behaves, most people try to be normal. If you tell people this is what's expected or this is what's normal, most people try to achieve it. If you tell people this is what's normal and you find ways of monitoring or surveying them to see whether they are being normal, people will naturally self-police themselves, they'll adopt a governmentality. So just an example of that which you're going to come across um, with people, your professors and lecturers at university. At the end of every module you're going to be asked to fill in student satisfaction. Well, what happens with that? That is a way of reporting or monitoring what's gone on in the classroom and online and on Moodle pages. And as a staff member, we get given our scores and an average across the university. And if we're below that average, we have to put in place a plan to try to raise ourselves up. So all of this is what Foucault is trying to, to talk about. Right? What happens is loads of staff, you know, we all talk about or give students sweets when they fill out their set sems because then they give you higher scores or play loads of videos or get guest lecturers because they give you higher scores now people aren't doing that necessarily because they think no one does that in Nottingham by the way but people don't do that because they think it's the best way to educate you people don't buy sweets for you or take pizza in when you're doing your set sem because they like you they're doing it because they are scared that if they don't get high scores they're going to get punished so they're disciplining their behaviour. They're changing the ways that they act for fear that when it's revealed to the organisation there'll be some punishment. Now in actual fact there isn't any punishment. <laughs> the university, will, a university, would happily turn around and say we don't make people buy sweets and pizzas and stuff. But that is what happens, right? This is what Foucault's work has been used to try to understand. The importance of surveying people. Like another little example if we start taking a register of attendance, attendance goes up. Not because anything happens, but just because knowing that you're being watched, knowing that people are monitoring you, can change your, not everybody's, but can change your behaviour. So this is what Foucault was getting at. Now, like Karl Marx, Foucault is not an organisation theorist, but his ideas have been applied in the study of organisations and have been incredibly influential in understanding human resource management in particular, performance management, the design of buildings. If you think about the panopticon, it's literally physical space. So people have looked at open plan offices as a way of creating panopticons within contemporary organisations. It's been incredibly important and powerful. So hopefully that's helped you to understand what, what Foucault is getting at and to think a little bit about how it's been his ideas of surveillance have been applied to the study of organisations.